Hi, this is Pastor Ron from Alpha Lions Den Ministries. This is a home of the truth seekers. Now listen, if you're a seeker of the truth, if you're a truth seeker, we're looking for you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if you're seeking for Jesus and you really want to know the truth, because it's only the truth that you know will set you free. Look, if you're, if you're tuning in on television, you can watch us on Cornerstone Television. That's ctvn.org. It's in Wall, Pennsylvania. I would also like you to tune in to Crossing Paths Ministries. That is crossingpaths.org. You can also find that on the internet, or you can watch us on Cornerstone Television every single Wednesday at 530 and every single Sunday at 12 o'clock. If you have the opportunity, please DVD us. And if you want to come personally and meet us at the Lion's Den, and you're a true seeker, come visit us. We're in Derry, Pennsylvania, 716 West 4th Avenue. Look forward to seeing you real soon. Jesus for 30 years but they don't even know the basic principles of the kingdom many of them are still worshiping idols in ignorance and I really think about this I think how many of them are going to make it into heaven or if they do make it it's only going to be by the grace of the Lord that's the only way they're going to be able to make it, I'm telling you. And the more knowledge, the more knowledge, the more that knowledge is increased, we have a better understanding of where we are in the times and the seasons that we're living in. And you know, everything as far as eschatology for me and the things that I've learned in the kingdom all go back 
to Matthew 24. And it has an exact layout of the events of the history of what's going to happen throughout all of history, and especially when we get to the end of days, the end of time. And I was thinking the other day about this whole thing about pre-mid and post-tribulation, because I'm going to tell you, all these things are going to come to a head before the Messiah returns. Because I talk to so many people and they're like, well, this will pan out, that'll pan out, this will work out, that'll work out. I really don't study that. I really don't care about that. I really don't. And you know, when we look at the Bible, the only book in the entire Bible that says, blessed are they that readeth and understand the words of this book is the book of Revelation. Everything, everything, the importance of where we are in the history of the world, everything evolves around the book of Revelation now. We, according to Matthew 24, we are a part of that generation. Because it, it, it clearly states in Matthew 24 that this generation shall not pass. Well, what generation? It's the generation that sees all these things take place. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilence. Israel becoming a nation is probably the last sign in that chapter that is the, the stake in the ground of where the, I really believe the gun was sounded, boom. That was the start at the end of the age. Now, recently we had just learned about this, the whole thing about the red heifer. It's on my mind because I just heard about this yesterday. But the red heifer, there had to be a red heifer in order for the Jews to be able to sacrifice for their sins as a whole, as a nation. Just like, listen to this, just like Jesus could not have returned to the earth. Jesus could not have returned to the earth unless Israel was a nation. Do, do we understand that? So when Jesus, when Israel became a nation, that gun was fired, boom, and the beginning of the end started. Before that, the Messiah could not have returned. So Israel had to become a nation. And more importantly, Jerusalem had to be the capital. Just think about that. That another aspect of everything is the wings of the great eagle have to be parked over Jerusalem to protect her, it says, for a time, times, and a half time. So we know that is a part of the tribulation. But let's go back to the red heifer. The Jews have been looking for this red heifer now for years. They, they found two, and the one had one blonde hair on its chest. So that eliminated it. That's how specific God is. We don't think God's that specific. God is very specific. So one blonde hair in the chest of that red heifer eliminated that red heifer for being used as the atonement or for the sacrifice of the sins of the Jewish people. Now, I had just learned last night that the Jews have a concern because they believe that the Messiah is returning to the earth very shortly. Now, the only difference between the Jews 
and the Gentile believers is that they believe that this is the first coming of the Messiah. Now we believe, Christians, born again Gentiles believe that there are two advents to the coming of the Messiah. One, he came as, as Liam said, as a baby. He came during the Feast of Tabernacles. I believe he was placed in a suit coat, or which is a tabernacle that's erected by hand. That was the first advent, of which the Jews missed the first advent. So now that places us in this situation. The Jews are still looking for the first coming of the Messiah, how he comes to the earth as a king or a representative, as a lion, a world ruler. This is the way he is going to come. We, as born-again Gentile believers, believe the exact same thing. We believe he's coming back to the earth to set up his kingdom on the earth. The only difference is this, is that the Jews missed it the first time. That's the only difference. Now, going back to the red heifer. So now they have one red heifer. They believe that they're so close to the coming of the Messiah that they have to know that the sacrifice of that heifer will be sufficient for the sins of all the Jews. And one of the sins they're concerned about is them being around dead bodies. Because see, if you get so close to a dead body or you touch a dead body, according to the Old Testament, you're considered unclean. Because of the transfer of spirits and just simply being around a dead body. Now I watch Gentiles today when they go to these funerals, they cry and wail and they lay over those dead bodies and they touch the dead bodies and there's transfer of spirits when that happens. But anyway, they say that this red heifer must be sacrificed, this cow has to be sacrificed, and there's a process that it goes through according to numbers, and it's the, it is mixed, the blood is mixed with water. And, it, and it's sprinkled over the people for the forgiveness of their sins to cleanse all, A-L-L, -L, all Jews from their sins. Now their concern is this, is this, is this, is that one red heifer sufficient? Because it's not, then there's no need to sacrifice in just one because it's not going to cleanse the whole the people, as many as they think, would need this because it hasn't been done in so long. But what's interesting about this is, is the Jews would only be doing this as a trial run. They just did a trial run. They took a cow. They sacrificed the cow. They mixed it, according to numbers, with the water. And they tried to figure out if this is what would be sufficient for the forgiveness of the Jews as a nation. Now for them to be doing that, they have to be mindful that there is a temple now or will be a temple very shortly in order for them to do this. Now some have said that this red heifer has to be three years of age. <clears throat> this one's not that old yet. But they, if they think they got to wait three years, first of all, the cow will get bigger than what it is, and secondly, it will give them time to prepare for the temple. But why am I saying all this? I'm saying all this because they know that the temple's going to be rebuilt. And we know the temple has to be rebuilt. The rebuilding of that temple is 
definitely one of the major signs at the end of time. <coughs> because we know that when they asked Jesus what would be the sign of thy coming in the end of the age, he gave them the list in Matthew 24, and at the end of the list, or near the end of the list, he talked about the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So Daniel spoke of the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist would set himself up in the temple. That would be at the three and a half year mark. So before the three and a half year mark has to take place, there has to be a temple. So this is how close we are to this happening. I, I showed you the film, I showed you the videos from the actual conference for the peace treaty. Now we know according to Daniel 9, 27, that he's going to make a covenant with many. He's going to make a peace treaty with many. And at the signing of that covenant, that's going to be the other gun that shoots off. It's going to start the final seven years on God's time clock. So listen to this. We had one gun that fired in 1948 that started the last generation. And now we're to the point where the people watching them preparing for the signing of the peace treaty. I mean, so think about this. When that peace treaty is signed, listen, there's a maximum of seven years left on this earth for believers. Seven years. So listen, we've been at this church about 17 years. Think how fast that has went. Think back seven years ago how fast that went since we've been here. Seven years isn't long. I mean, we really have to, we have to open our eyes and understand where we are on God's time clock. Because we are, I used to say, well, we're in the first quarter. Oh, we're in the second quarter. Oh, we're at halftime. Oh, we're in the third quarter. We're in the fourth quarter. Uh, I believe now we're in the two-minute drill. And as the one old guy told me one time, he said, no, I, I believe we're in overtime. I believe we're in borrowed time right now. These, these signs that are just swirling around us. But the concern that I have is, is to think about the people that we know that do not know Jesus, that have not been born again. I mean, think about this. That they do not know. Jesus, did he not tell Nicodemus? He said, listen, a man must be born again. Marvel not that I tell you this, Nicodemus, a man must be born again. So Nicodemus said, what am I to do? Do I have to go back into my mother's womb and be born all over? Jesus said, no. He said, that which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit of God is spirit. So just think of the people that you know that don't even know Jesus. Then out of those that know Jesus, think about how many have been taught lies and deception through the, through the whole time that they have been taught. They were born as a little infant spiritually and the only thing that they've heard throughout all these years is lies and deception. So that's all they know is lies and deception. There's going to have to be something, I believe, in the, in the end of time that sparks in the midst of the great falling away a great revival. It's going to be twofold, like a sharp-edged sword. 
And I believe that is the one event that Jesus pointed to in Matthew 24 that Daniel spoke of. And that's the abomination of desolation. I really believe that there'll be a great falling away before that of which we may be a part of now and it might have happened before they say like in the dark ages because I believe that a lot of the prophecies of the end times are dual, they have a dual meaning which means they happen before and they're going to also happen again in the end times. So this, this is where we are. We're seeing so many of these prophecies, these dual prophecies take place, things that have happened in the past and now they're taking place again. But sooner or later, something is going to have to wake the church up as a whole Be one of one of these signs is, is the signing of the peace treaty. Would you not think that these people have, that have been believed that have taught all this all these years when that peace treaty is signed and they're still sitting here, do you not think that's going to get their attention? Everybody, all of us, all born again Christians have been taught that before that peace treaty is signed, the church is going to be raptured out of here. Now, I personally don't believe that. I do not believe that is scriptural whatsoever. I do not believe that there is one place in the entire Bible that it talks about a pre-trib rapture. I believe there's nowhere in the Bible you could even show me a rapture. Nowhere. Margaret MacDonald, a Catholic, thought this up because she believed that God wouldn't let his people suffer. Now, every time in the Bible, every time it's mentioned in the Bible, it talks about the coming of the Lord or the day of the Lord, which those two events are the same. Do you understand that? Now, my question is this. Why wouldn't they call it the day of the Lord or the coming of the Lord? Because that would blow a pre-trib rapture totally out of the water. They cannot call it the day of the Lord or the coming of the Lord. They had to make up a total new name with a new meaning to even be able to talk about it. That's why I don't like the people that talk about a post coming of the Lord or the post caught up of the saints. I don't even like them calling it the rapture. Because the rapture was never taught. That theory, that concept was never taught by anybody. The early church taught about the coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord, which is the same event. Ezekiel, that's what he talked about. Jeremiah, that's what he talked about. Isaiah, that's what he talked about. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Barnabas, that's all they talked about. They never talked about a preacher of rapture. You never see it anywhere. They always talked, and if you look every single place in the Bible that talks about this, it talks about the day of the Lord and the coming of the Lord. Those are the only two things that are ever mentioned in the Bible. And when they are mentioned, we have to link it to those two events. The, the, the gun was started in 1948, boom, for the last generation to be here. And the next shot that's gonna be fired is at the signing of the peace treaty. The only reason 
that that peace treaty has not been signed already is this. There had to be that shift on God's calendar to get us to that half a year mark. <coughs> and that's why for the first time in the history of the world, Israel elected their prime minister and it wasn't accepted. This is the only time in the history of the world that there has to be another vote. Greg, you might have to readjust me there. I'm gonna go up here and sit for a few minutes. You're making me work too hard today. But listen, all these things, all these things that we're talking about that are happening right now are happening for the first time in the history of the world. I mean, think about this. Israel becoming a nation, first time in the history of the world. Jerusalem becoming the capital, first time in the history of the world this is, this is taking place now. The signing of the peace treaty, first time in the history of the world. Now, when I watch this, when I watch the election of Benjamin B.B., and all of a sudden they started to say, well, this could be the first time in the history of Israel that the prime minister has been elected and he's not going to be officially voted in, that they're going to have to have a re-vote. Because you need two of the major parties to come into agreement to have over 61 points for them to elect a prime minister to him, for him to be elected. It's just like a democracy that we have, that we vote. And when they said that that would not be official, I immediately began to think, okay, is this going to have anything to do with a six-month period? Why six months? Because all through the book of, tribula the book of Re Revelation, when it talks about the tribulation period, it talks about a, a split there at the middle of seven years, which is exactly three and a half years. So somewhere you have to get a half. It talks about 1,260 days. It talks about a time, time and a half time, which is one year, two years and a half a year. That's a three and a half year period. So these are the things that get us thinking about a, about a half of a year period there. So as soon as this vote was not accepted by Israel, that they had a standing prime minister that was accepted, they said they were going to have to have a re-vote. And they, they moved it six months. And which made me think, I mean, I thought, well, wait a second. If what I know what we've already discussed this morning about the two advents. There's two advents, two comings of the Messiah. There's not three. There's not a, there's not a rapture that takes place that's aside from one of the comings. That would make it three comings. There's the first coming when he comes as a babe, and there's the second time as he's coming as a king. That's it. But when I saw that, I thought, okay, if this one happened at the Feast of Tabernacles, and we know the Feast of Tabernacles has not been fulfilled yet. Are you with me? The Feast of Tabernacles has to be fulfilled, which means it will take place at the second advent, because it's like another dual prophecy. He came the first time when? During the Feast of Tabernacles. He's going to come when? During the second time. During the Feast of Tabernacles. When he returns to the earth. So I thought in order for this to take place, the signing of the peace treaty is going to have to happen during that week of the Feast of Tabernacles. Are you with me? Because it is a, a perfect Shemitah cycle. It is exactly a seven year cycle that will start at the beginning at a Feast of Tabernacles. 
and it will end at the Feast of Tabernacles. So what is going to start it? The start of it is going to be caused by the signing of the peace treaty. It is going to end by the coming of the Messiah to the earth. Are you with me? So now they've switched the vote. They couldn't have released it seven, six months ago because that way on God's time calendar, everything would have been off. It wouldn't happen in October. So they slide it exact, not one month, not one week, not two months, not two weeks, not three months, not three weeks. They slid it exactly six months. That put the new vote in Israel to mid to end of September. When the vote will be finalized, They'll announce if it's approved or not, which still gives two weeks in that period for once he is elected as prime minister for them to immediately release the peace treaty. Because Benjamin automatically called or had Donald Trump contacted and said, listen, you cannot release the peace treaty now. Why? Because he's not the stand-in prime minister. He has to be elected back in. Now, if they released it early, he was fearful that he was going to lose the election. So they had this agreement that said, listen, you wait and we'll release it right after. So what we saw on the video that you must look up, look up Jerry Kushner, the Peace and Prosperity Conference, and look at that entire conference, start off with the first one. That is what we saw. We saw the fact that that peace treaty is already in motion. They just couldn't put the, the cart before the horse. Do you understand? They had to wait until the proper time to pull the trigger to release that. God had to cause them to wait in order for it to fall on the Feast of Tabernacles to begin and end on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I believe that if it doesn't happen at this one, it can happen in the next year. Or it can happen in the next year. Or it can happen in the next year. But I believe these are the signs and the times that's swirling around these specific dates. Why? Because these are Moedans. But more importantly than this, is these are signs of the end of the time. These are signs of the last days in which we're living. I watch, it's just not at our church. Me, me and Deborah had a, a, a luncheon with a couple the other day that have 800 people in their church. And the things they were talking about is the exact same things that we talked that happened in our church. Exactly. I mean exactly. People coming, people going, what they say when they come, what they say when they go. Oh, God sent me here. This is the greatest ministry. I've never heard truth like this. This is the best. That's the best. You have a great outreach. The food ministry is the greatest. The golf outing is the greatest. The, the YouTube's the greatest. Everything's the greatest. I'm never going to leave. We're committed here forever. Next thing you know, they'll cause some commotion. They'll grab a couple weak people, whoever listened to them, could whine and complain, and then they take them. That, that's, that, listen, we've been here for 17, 18 years, and that's the one consistent thing that I can definitely point to. It is an absolute pattern. And when you see a pattern in the kingdom, there's a reason for that. I just can't figure out the way to stop it yet. Because you have to try to trust somebody somewhere at some time. You have to be willing to try to trust somebody. 
Now, who would think out of the people that you trust in a ministry or a church that they'd turn into the devil within two years or one year or six months after you meet them? And it's not like that the churches are trying to hurt these people. The churches are trying to help them. But everybody wants their own this, their own that, their own ministry, their own church, their own Bible study, their own whatever they want to do. You watch every one of them, they do the same thing. I could write you 10, 10 of them from our church and I could show you they did the exact same thing. And this guy I'm talking to could show us a hundred that did the exact same thing. And if you look at the church as a whole, this is what's happening at every single church. They come in some way, God sent them, this is the greatest, you guys are the greatest, God told me to be a part of this ministry. Then next thing you know, well, you know, he said this, she said that, they did this, they did that, they sowed some bad seed. Next thing you know, as soon as they hear a couple people who listen to them, they'll just keep running with the crowd, and then next thing you know, then the same God that told them to come here, next thing you know, I guess he tells them to leave. And, and I mean, but we know they do that on their own because they don't come in or leave the right way. So, but when you see this as a pattern in every single church and every single minister that I'm talking to, when you see churches being affected or hurt by this, this is a thread in the great falling away. I have tried everything I can possibly do to try to prevent that. I tell people what they're going to do before these people do it, and they still do it, and people still get misled. I watch it in everything. It is definitely a thread in the great falling away. So as we look at this, if we, as we look at all these points that we've seen for, that are happening in the first time in the history of the world, let me tell you something. Israel can only become a nation like this in the end times one time. There can only be the signing of the peace treaty that the peace treaty is being signed. It can only happen one time. There can only be one abomination of desolation who sets himself up in that temple. That can only happen one time. Here's another one people have asked me. They said, well, how do you know this is the peace tree? Well, first of all, just consider these things. Has there ever been another Donald Trump in the history of the world? Nope. There have only been one man like him to be voted in as a president in the history of the world. Does he have tremendous favor with Israel and Jerusalem? Absolutely. Do they consider him the Cyrus? Do they consider him the one who is going to financially fund or rebuild the temple? He's already allotted $51 million. I mean, $51 billion. 51 billion has already been approved to go to that peace treaty. We, we saw it on film here. We watched it. 51 B billion has already been allotted for them to build the temple. I mean, these things are happening. These things that I'm mentioning today are just a few of the things that are gonna only happen one time. They're not, they're not going to happen again. So in that peace treaty, it says this. It says, first of all, that there must be a shared agreement. Now, how would I know that? Because that's what the Bible says. Because it says that Jews that live in the West Bank or Judea, when they see that abomination of desolation set up himself in the temple of God, proclaiming himself as God, they have to flee to the mountains. Get out of there. Hit the ground running, Urban Baxter says. There, there's going to be mass, mass killings when you see this happen. When this guy puts himself up in the temple, 
and you have a shared agreement over there in the West Bank with the Israelites and the Palestinians, they're going to start killing one another immediately. So there's going to have to be a shared agreement. <laughs> the agreement's going to have to be with Israel and Palestine, of which both of these are at the forefront in all the, you know, it's going to have to be, have a seven-year cycle in there somewhere, which is in this peace treaty. Jerusalem is going to have to be protected by the wings of the great eagle according to Revelation 13 or 12 and 13. Jerusalem is going to have to be protected to stay capital for a time, times and a half time, a three and a half year period. We know that has to take place. And all these things are in that peace treaty. All these things are in the peace treaty. That we know they're basically already going through with it. They're setting up, okay, this is how the airports are going to be built. This is how the streets are going to be built. This is how the hospitals are going to be built. This is how we're going to fund it. $51 billion has already been allotted. They just can't pull the veil off yet. They can't release it because it's not lined up with God's calendar yet. So things are happening to push it along a little bit. It could happen this year, it could happen next year, it could happen next year, but there's only so many years here in this window that this could happen. Because listen, this is the first red heifer that, that, that the Jews have found in over 2,000 years since the temple's been destroyed that they could sacrifice for their sin. And in order to make this sacrifice, they have to have a temple. The only reason why they can't build a temple now is this, is they don't have a peace treaty telling them that they can build a temple. Because the world may stop it. But if it's in the peace treaty, if it's in the agreement, they might be able to do that over there. And as far as everybody going, oh, they won't be able to slaughter that many animals. Well, Ramadan, they do it every single year for the Muslims. They sacrifice thousands of lambs every year during Ramadan. The Muslims do. So the Jews will be able to do it in the shared agreement. It also tells us in Revelation, he told John the Revelator to measure the uh, to measure the temple. He said, so there has to be a temple built to measure the temple. He said, but don't measure the outer court. Well, why? Because it's going to be given to the Gentiles to trample underfoot. So there has to be a period where it's given back to the Gentiles to be trampled underfoot. There has to be a temple that's been rebuilt. He told them, don't measure the outer court because it's, it's going to be trampled down. There are so many things right now that we could continue to reveal and discuss. And this is just skimming the surface. But why I want you to see these things is a lot of people that don't understand the difference between the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, and this thing, whatever that is that they call the preacher of rapture. It's totally different. And I believe as we progress through in time, there's going to have to become a boldness in the church to say, listen, the, the preacher of rapture is just not scriptural at all whatsoever. It is not scriptural. It is not nowhere to be found in the Bible. As a matter of fact, we need to address it for what it is. And what is it? It's the coming of the Lord. And that event is called the day of the Lord. It's not called a preacher of rapture anymore. So that, that's the truth as far as where we are on God's time clock and really what is happening now in these last days. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to pause before we partake of communion this morning. I just want you to bow your heads where you are. We're going to have a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we thank you for this morning, for this opportunity, Lord, that you've called us to assemble in this place. Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your Spirit would say to the church in these last days. 
Lord, this is just simply skimming the surface. This is just sharing a few nuggets of your truth regarding the tribulation, the abomination of desolation, the sacrificing of the animals, Israel becoming a nation, Jerusalem being protected by the great eagle. These are just basic truths regarding the coming of the Messiah. I pray, Lord, that you would write these upon our heart, Lord. Show us the truth. Lord, you said that we were to be truth seekers, and we seek for those. You said that you seek for those that worship you in spirit and in truth. So we also seek for them. We look for those people. You told us, Lord, you said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So we pray for healing in our bodies, Lord God. We pray for the men and women of this ministry, Lord, that have dedicated their lives unto you, that serve you to the best of their ability. And we pray for healing in their bodies. We pray for Mary Ann today in the hospital, Lord, with this stroke situation. We pray for that. We lift her up to you in Jesus' name. Lord, for the people that you've called to be a part of this ministry, Lord, I just pray that you would stir them up in their spirits. Let them, let them hear the truth again. Let them watch us on YouTube. Let them do whatever they need to do to spark a revival, Lord God. You could cause all things, you do cause all things to work together for the good. For them who love you and who are the called according to your purpose. So we commit ourselves unto you, Lord God, and we trust you in all things. We ask for healing in our bodies, and we thank you for it in advance for the things that you're going to do. Amen. All right, what's Pastor Ron coming back at you? For all you truth seekers that, that tune in to our sermons on YouTube, you can YouTube us. For all you YouTubers out there, just do Ron Kosor, K-O-S-O-R. Or you can YouTube Truth Seekers. We're also on Crossing Paths Ministries that airs on Cornerstone Television out of Wall, Pennsylvania. Crossing Paths is on every single Wednesday at 5.30 and every Sunday at 12. So you can tune on and watch us or please DVD us. We're also on the Family Faith Network, the Faith, the, uh, Faith Family Channel. And um, I look forward to you tuning in on that also. You can find us on the web. Hope you enjoyed today's message. Please tune in next week. And for all you true seekers, keep on seeking.